My name is Rob Benetton. I'm the Urban Ag Advisor for the Bay Area for uh, the University of California Cooperative Extension. And uh, we're here today to talk about cover crops. Um, cover cropping is a perennial practice. And we're going to just do a little intro on the speaker and take it from there. So this workshop is called Cover Crop Planning and Establishment in Small to Medium Sized Row Crops, Orchards and Vineyards. Our speaker today is Mr. Gary Pearson. Uh, Gary has been in ag all of his life, uh, starting on a peach farm in Modesto and graduated from UC Davis in viticulture. He spent 37 years managing the UC Davis greenhouse system on campus and has presented in various parts of the world, including Afghanistan, Iraq, Ghana, Dubai, and most recently in Cuba. Currently here, he is the career technical education grant manager for the Davis School District and oversees funding for the six pathways related to uh, career and technical education. He has done successful cover cropping via hands-on applications for his entire career. And uh, today this uh, webinar will go from 3 to 4 p.m. We will have a, about a half an hour or a little less than that for Q&A at the end as well uh, as a couple of other shares also. So thanks so much, uh, Gary, and feel free uh, to take it away. Thank you everyone for joining. Uh, we ask that you please uh, introduce yourself and your organization via the chat as well. We have someone recording that. Uh, and I also have to thank our other team members, Kamyar Aram, uh, the Ag Crops Advisor, and Julio Contreras uh, with the East Bay Ag Team, uh, Community Education Specialist. Thanks so much. Gary, go ahead. And uh, we'll say Ben Weiss also from the RCDs. Oh, and too. also, yes, uh, Benjamin Wise from the uh, Country Coastal Resource Conservation District, as well as uh, Derek, a new staff person with them as well. Thanks. I'll say only my mother calls me Benjamin. I go by Ben. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be back at the end to answer some questions. Okay, Rob, uh, I got to be able to uh, share. <laughs> Yeah. You should be able to share now, Gary. Sorry as well. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You're you're cool. All right. Thanks again, Gary. Okay. Here we go. Um, as Rob uh, alluded to, uh, uh, this is a presentation on cover crops. Uh, one part of your um, systems uh, dealing with row crops, open space. Uh, backyard gardens, uh, all of the above. Um, and I come from a practical experience. Um, I've been doing cover crops at a specific site in Davis um, <laughs> for about the last 20 years uh, before that. Uh, and during that time, I was um, in uh, greenhouses and did a lot of fundamental research. Uh, and that's uh, kind of my forte. I've traveled around the world uh, been some interesting places. So we can chat about that at another time. Uh, what we're going to do today is just uh, give an overview, look at equipment, look at the, some of the fundamentals of, of cover crops, why we do things uh, specifically, and, and, and really uh, looking at some uh, examples. And in your situations, you'll see, you'll see it and how you apply it. And uh, we'll have some specific examples where uh, we'll look at some uh, non-level types of contours. And if we get time at the end, then I'll show you some of that. Uh, we're going to talk about implements, equipment, and, and such. We'll talk about my experiences also. So with that, uh, what we're about, uh, I actually pulled this uh, example of cover crops and roots. Um, in the lower right-hand corner in here, uh, those are non-inoculated. Uh, these are inoculated, though sometimes it looks like they're nematodes. Um, those are the rhizomes. Um, that's what you want. That's what you need in order to really uh, pr produce the nitrogen fixation you're trying to achieve. Um, uh, I actually pulled this out of my home garden. Uh, couldn't find any over at my other site. I haven't uh, got everything planted and started, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that as we go along. 
So um, this is on, on common bean. Um, and all the different types of nitrogen fixers, you're gonna see some sort of uh, nodules and it's good to go and dig them out and look at them. Highly recommend it. Um, now, in this time of the year, I'm starting to think about, okay, I'm doing land preparation. Uh, I'm looking at my soils. I'm doing um, pre, lots of pre-activities, uh, ground getting ready. Uh, if I'm doing any specific soil amendments, uh, in this situation that I'm facing now, I'm going to be growing both a multiplex, a blend, and also I'm going to be uh, growing wheat. Uh, that's a new one for me. Um, so I'll, <laughs> it ties right into what we're doing and, and looking at drills and drill systems. So that's an example of a purple vetch. Um, and I have two community garden volunteers that help me quite a bit in, in this system. Uh, that's our wonderful fava bean. Um, non-inoculated. So there's a question, fundamental question, if your soils have been inoculated before, are they still continuing to be inoculated? Uh, do they still have inoculum? Um, that's really critical as we go about uh, thinking about that. In my experience, uh, once you've pretty much inoculated your soils, you're pretty good uh, for a number of years. Now this will be the first time probably in 10 years that I'll go back and inoculate. And inoculation is very simple straightforward. Some people say you got to wet it. Some people say you put it on dry. I put it on dry and it, it's been fine for me. Now this is the one we're gonna, I'm gonna kind of focus a bit on uh, because I, I prefer the multiplex. I prefer because of the diversity uh, of the seed and the types. So if we have peas, if we have fava beans, we have vetch, uh, we got regular beans, etc. I'm gonna get pretty good stand of cover crop. Uh, as in previous webinar, webinars, we talk about different soil conditions, different weather conditions, and germination, and, and what happens, because uh, you can get a massive flood uh, in the fall, and you know, you're trying to, in my situation, we're trying to uh, get the fall rains to germinate things. Soil temperature is gonna be critical. If you plant it too late, your soils are cold. If you plant it too early, your soils are too hot, you're gonna, it's going to affect your germination. So by going to the multi-blends, uh, you're, you're going to guarantee yourself some a pretty good success. And each year is different. So last year, um, I had a really strong stand of mustard um, because there was a, uh, uh, a residual mustard patch out there. So I got lots of mustard. I had an exceptionally cold winter in my location. So the mustard started to appear. Uh, my, my, in one section, my veg did outstandingly well, and in another part, it didn't do so well because I had a different soil condition. And at the time, um, this is one of the issues you face is rodents, specifically squirrels, who like to go and they like to mine things. And <laughs> they, I, so I started seeing patches of, uh, uh, a vetch all through the field to the south of me and I, they've been over mining my field and taking my seed. So those are the unintended, unintended consequences of sometimes what you do. Um, so I, I, tend to, I tend to stay with the multiplex, but uh, in the situation that I have, uh, I'm trying to also instruct uh, kids in uh, high school FFA who've never seen this in their lives. They have no clue what a cover crop is. They've studied the life cycle. They understand what nitrogen fixation and nitrogen cycle means, but they have no clue what it looks like in the field. So I'm intentional about bringing those students out uh, from our high school and showing them. So I actively get them engaged in what's kind of going on. So what do we need to know? Oh my gosh, this is where it gets uh, kind of complicated. And uh, I've dealt with every one of these situations all through the years. Um, you know, you can see from the list there, uh, first and fundamental is the soil type. Now, the soil type I have is called a Brentwood type. It's a very heavy clay soil. It's difficult to break up the clods. Um, so your timing of your operations is really critical, uh, even in spring. Um, once you chop down the cover crop, then you've got to get on it right away and turn it and open it. you got to incorporate it. Uh, that could be challenging. You could get a dry north wind and dry everything out, and then you got among this clots. Uh, soil type 
uh, you know, I look at soil pH and then I, I amend things before I go. The pH of my soil, then what I do is about 8.2. Your situation might be totally different. So you need to know what that soil analysis looks like. Uh, what kind of crop are you going to be putting in it? Um, whether it's a vineyard, whether it's an orchard, whether you're going to be coming back with a vegetable uh, system. Uh, you have to take that in consideration. And so the forward planning is really critical. Um, I also, how are you going to irrigate this? Uh, now the stuff that I've done this summer has all been drip tape. Uh, I modified all of my systems to do drip tape because water was becoming, uh, I was trying to demonstrate to the students that how do we manage uh, with drip tape. So all of the garden vegetables that I grew out there, all the pumpkins that you see all over my shoulder, uh, I grew about 200 pumpkins for several community groups here. Uh, drip tape was really important. I hadn't tried that before and it turned out marvelously well, but it's a careful management. I'm not suggesting you do drip tape, but how you manage the moisture and especially that germination. So having uh, good seed tilth and how you prepare your soils is really, really important. Um, do I irrigate my cover crops? Normally, we, we have to think about um, the fall, we usually get a winter rain to kind of kick us off. Uh, sometimes we don't get it till January. Uh, last year, I didn't have a really good moisture until late November. That affects germination. Uh, what about the cost? Uh, right now, uh, my fava bean ran me about 50 cents a pound. Um, I get it in bulk. I buy uh, 50 pound sacks. Uh, my uh, vetch, purple vetch, is about $1.25 a pound. My multiplex is about between 75 and 90 cents, depends upon the blend. And when I say blend, you as a, as a person in your specific area, you can request blends. That's a little more costly but it uh, depends on your situation. Can we grow our own? You know, I've, I've tried that. Uh, it's interesting. I don't, it depends upon the year and how well everything is working, but sometimes I've been successful. Other times, uh, not so successful. Um, cropping history, beneficial insects, harmful insects. You know, there's the good bugs and the bad bugs. Uh, and I'm always looking out in the, either the orchard or the row crop, I'm, I'm looking for, you know, my beneficial insects. Um, I'm looking for my harmful ones too, because there's that competition, especially sometimes fava bean uh, gets aphids. Well, do I have ladybugs out there? Do I have other uh, predatory insects? So know what those are. Um, and uh, if you don't, there's some pretty good uh, extension stuff on that. Uh, UC Davis uh, has a pretty good literature background. Um, and then what are the real inputs? That's always a characteristic. Okay, what's my tractor cost? What's my fuel cost? What are my implements costing me if I'm renting or I have everything? If I don't, in a lot of situations, who am I gonna borrow it from, especially in our small farm situation? And, and locally, I, I have a really good network of people, uh, especially the spring tooth harrow and, and some of the more exotic types of of uh, implements. I, I, I only use the, the harrow. I'll show you a picture of a harrow uh, in a moment, but uh, harrows, they're kind of ancient pieces, uh, unless you're really a modern day farmer and then you've got a lot of different things. And then the other things is how are we going to plant the cover crop? Are we going to use a drill? What kind of drill? We're going to look at some pictures. I'll talk about them. Uh, hand spreaders. Uh, you know, I've experienced all kinds of different types of hand spreaders. And we, you know, I can say, hey, this is a good one. This is, nah, maybe not. Um, I grew up on a family farm in Modesto. And uh, in our peach orchard, actually, we established a bunch of cover crops. But we, did, we broadcast it from the back of the tractor on the trailer. And I grew up as a kid doing that. So I have the hands-on kinds of things. And sometimes that's the simplest way to do it. You're going you're gonna to find, though, you're going to use more seed. But again, <laughs> it's, if you have it, you have it. If you don't, you don't. Uh, water and no water just depends on what your water availability is. I know in the, in the Central Valley uh, here, um, I'm, I'm all, uh, water is provided for me through um, the main water lines. I don't have to worry uh, about irrigation water or ditch water. Um, and, and, and in essence, the water I use is groundwater. The water I have now comes out of the Sacramento River. So uh, that has some challenges. So 
Um, and then we talked about inoculation. Uh, the fundamental other thing is uh, rates per acre. That's always kind of an interesting thing to me as I thought about it and experienced it. Because sometimes your, your bags or your source, it says it doesn't really say how much per acre. What does a per acre mean? And how do you break it down into smaller units? And, and sometimes it's your own practical experience. Um, and then uh, your sources, uh, you know, I, there's a lot of good seed companies around here and they're commercial people, that, that's what they do. So uh, hillsides, flat areas, uh, how do you mitigate the erosion potential? Uh, that's a big problem. How do you put that all on and still not lose all your topsoil or related uh, things? And how long does it really take for cover crops to be effective? Well, my experiences are, it took 10 years. So uh, when I really started thinking about cover crops in 2014 or 2004, um, I had a daughter in the high school FFA program. And so they had a, a land assignment that I just kind of took over and maintained. So I was being very proactive in thinking that through. What's this soil going to, the texture, the tilt, the fertility, uh, what's it going to look like in, in 2020? So I was very intentional in, in how I selected certain things. And then my power of observation and persistence really paid off. Uh, if you go look at the, the texture of the soil now and what we've done, and we've done other things besides just cover crops. Uh, we've come in with some pretty heavy duty compost um, and some other uh, just primarily organic uh, uh, amendments. Um, I'm a, in this day and age, I do believe in the power of organic systems. Uh, but there are times where I have to look at outside of that to think about how I'm going to uh, grow this crop. So um, I've been doing this for a while, and this is the season. I, I enjoy it. Um, you'll find me at uh, all hours, <laughs> especially early morning, uh, looking out on the, on the property and, and going from there. So I think we've kind of talked a little bit about cover crops, uh, benefits, challenges, uh, a bit. Um, and, you know, timing, uh, one of the challenges is timing. Um, sometimes you, you've just finished a harvest and you really don't want to go out there and try to prep the ground. That's the challenges of farming. You're tired, you go, okay, I finished this, now I got to go do this. Uh, hopefully you have a, a, a crew, uh, or in my case, I've got a core volunteer uh, that uh, I, I educate and then I've got a pretty good volunteer group. So it's a it's a challenge. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to build that organic material, uh, look at structure. Uh, and in my situation, it's, uh, it's, it's trying to keep the clods and pulverize the clods, frankly. Uh, cover crops do a really good job of doing that. And uh, in my opinion, and, and what I've seen over the years. So, um, so let's get on to the real stuff. Uh, what we've done here, um, I've also learned how to fly a drone. A drone? <laughs> the simple one, not fancy. Um, so these are production pictures. This is actually the current situation where I've done most of the major land preparation. This stuff to the south is not what I consider that it's part of the school district, so I can't touch it. That's my intrusion of squirrels and snakes and coyotes and jackrabbits and cottontails. Uh, Etc. So uh, this ground's all been prepared. I, I must say that I was fortunate to the neighbor farmer. Sometimes you have to be Johnny on the spot. They had a, a international 385 with a 24 foot disc with a with a what they call a roller packer. In my world, I've done the production side of it. So having that roller packer pulverized the clots. Then I went through, let it set, and then I pre-irrigated. Now I have access to water. You may not, you may be a dry land type farmer, okay? But I highly recommend that if you can pre-irrigate, that's gonna really improve your soil tilth when you come through and do your operations. And in this case, um, all I have down in here is I have a, a, a five foot or five foot rototiller uh, that I've done all this work on. I do have other implements. I have a disc, I have a chisel. Um, and if you can get your ground open a little bit, uh, that's going to help that water penetration and to hold the water capacity. Uh, you'd be amazed 
in the middle of June when I stick my shovel after I put my cover crop in that, oh my gosh, I still got moisture. And that's super critical. Um, anyway, this is what it would look like probably in about mid-November after I've planted. Uh, background, that's a school site. This is when the cover crops are just emerging and coming up. So uh, you can't really tell. This is a this lower area was the vetch. That turned out to be really in the spring. It was crazy how much vetch I had out there. Um, and then this was uh, my planting of uh, multiplex. And then I moved uh, over here. I had a third plot last year of fava bean. This piece of ground over on the east side of the campus is really a soil challenge. I have high magnesium, really bad magnesium, because when they, um, how do I know that? I'd have the soil analysis done, and it came back crazy how much mag. So uh, when they made this school site, they drug all of the tailings across over in here, and it really creates a problem. So I've had to go back and amend it with sulfur, sulfur, sulfur. I'll never get it cured. Uh, and I've done some other uh, treatments in trying to improve the soil fertility. And I can say I haven't been as successful as I should have been. Now I've grown melons over here. I've grown other things and you can tell uh, that there's still some problems. Uh, this other one right here is what it looks like in March, late February, March. And you can't really tell that fava bean is six feet tall. What that tells me for that plot of ground is we've got the soil fertility in extremely good condition. When you get a fava bean growth like this, and in the background you can see some mustard, and then there's some uh, other, there's also weed competition in here. So there's no herbicides that I've used. Uh, we get some sow thistle, we get some other um, weeds in there. Um, pretty much all of the uh, yellow star thistle gets choked out. So there's no post-emergent treatment for any of those nasty weeds. Uh, the challenge as you go through the season is I get Johnson grass uh, that uh, migrates in from the adjacent farm across the street. And so I have to go dig it out because I'm on a school site. I can't use what I call the weapons of mass destruction. So it's a challenge. I've done it with the tractor. I've done it by the shovel. And I've been to, to reduce the population of uh, Johnson grass. Uh, we also have crabgrass and Bermuda grass, but that's not as bad as the Johnson grass. And down in here, you can see where I've done some chopping just to reveal what happens. And you can see how lush and nice that is in February. And then when I fully chopped it and got it all completely chopped, what you don't see, I couldn't find a sequence where I'm actually turning it um, and turning the cover crop in. This all turned into a massive garden this summer. And the pumpkins, as you see in my background, I, I grew uh, one section, this whole section in pumpkins. And they turned out marvelous. So I think I hit it. <laughs> uh, this is actually what it looks like in the summer. This is uh, actually late May when it dries out a bit. Uh, and then that whole adjacent 22 acres, which you can't see, turns into this massive weed patch, which I can't control. So anyway, uh, that's my uh, particulars. Um, this is a slide that tells you the different types of multiplex uh, that is available. Um, and it just depends on what your flavor is. And uh, I, I tend to, I, I've tried the annual uh, ryegrass. Um, it tends to be a little bit spotty in, in this plot. So I've kind of migrated away from them and just stayed with the basics. Um, so, and I may go back uh, to it uh, if I'm seeing some other soil conditions. I've got plenty of organic material, frankly. Um, so I'm not as concerned about that um because i've grown a lot a few different crops in that plot but here's an example of where you can get and it also talks about the rates don't worry about the rates if you're in the in the zone you don't have to be super precise <laughs> just being in the zone and then you look at the crop stand so okay drills uh i hate to tell you there's there's all kinds of drills and all kinds of ways to do it I grew up with this kind of a grain drill. Uh, up until my dad stopped farming in the mid, uh, in the late 80s, that's how we established our wheat and the cover crops. I spent, I don't know how many hours lifting that, those, <laughs> uh, 
those roller packer cutters with those things. And actually, uh, as I grew up, we had one of these. That, that is really ancient. I don't recommend this. Um, and then here's some modern day types of no-till drills. And there's lots of examples of that. Uh, this is just one example. This is a heavy duty, narrow row type of uh, uh, no-till drill. Uh, this is the one that I use uh, frequently. It's heavy. Uh, it, it, I literally could cut cement. Seriously, those, those cutters down there and those packers, those are called packers. And then the drop things, I'll show you a picture of it. And then the more simple things, depending upon your size, depending upon what you're trying to do. Um, I, I'm gonna try these actually, just just because I've never tried before, to see how the crop stand works. Uh, then there's the um, belly spreaders, hand spreaders, ATVs. If you got an ATV, that's that saves your back. Uh, you also have these pull behinds that can do that. I've actually done two and a half acres with a hand spreader. Yep, <laughs> took me a while. <laughs> uh, belly spreaders are kind of unique. There's different types. Uh, and some do a better job than others. Uh, sometimes they jam easily and then you have to rock and roll it with it. Uh, I use a solo right now uh, for my small plots and that seems to be the best uh, so far. Um, it's wise, you know, it, it's you gotta look at them, look at them on YouTube and see how they work. So um, there's some others that are out there. These are just some examples. Um, uh, I like this because you load it you go and you're done. <laughs> so, uh, ground prep uh, equipment. Um, you would use the spring tooth harrow once you've got your cover crop in to make sure it gets covered. If you're using the no-till drill, you don't have to worry about it. But if you're just broadcasting it, you do need to go over with a spring tooth or some sort of harrow. There's this drag harrow, um, and those just have big spikes on them. Uh, you, you can't regulate how deep and how much you can cover. This you can regulate by these spring actions. Um, if you're on a three point, this is a drag, but they also make three points on, on a tractor. So you can kind of mitigate how things are covered. Um, sometimes if you haven't uh, plowed your soil, this is a two bottom plow. Uh, you have to have a little more horsepower to pull this through. Um, if you have a neighbor that has one of these, go borrow it every once in a while because it does help to turn and break up some of that subsoil. Um, it just depends on your situation, especially if you have a heavy, heavy um, population of cover crop and you're trying to turn it with a disc, you're not gonna be able to do it. So you may have to come back and do it. Um, this is just an example of a disc. It just depends on your situation. And even if you do non-till over a number of years, you're gonna reduce your water penetration at some point. So. Either you're going to disc it or you're going to use a single shank ripper. Uh, we commonly did that back in our orchards just because uh, we wanted to get the water penetration in the, in the winter uh, to get it down into the root zone. So um, I found this particular ripper uh, in a bone pile. <laughs> and I, I said, I got to have a ripper. Uh, your neighbors may have those in a bone pile. A bone pile is just a pile of equipment that you'll find. Um, and then we're unfortunate, uh, we're, we are fortunate to have a box scraper to, to do some things. Um, so uh, highly, if you have to contour and do, uh, sometimes you have to cut a tail ditch and a tail ditch is just so that when water, uh, you don't want your water to pool on your, in your cover crop, you want it to drain if you get a severe rain. Even in Davis, you can get uh, a 30 minute rain and get two inches of rain in 30 minutes. That's gonna cause puddling. That's good. And if it stays, then your cover crop may not be able to uh, survive. Um, so at the end of a field, especially in the row crop, they'll, they'll cut a tail. Um, then in the springtime, uh, we have our, our chopper. Um, this is a five foot chopper. Um, it's whatever you have. Um, I've done actually an acre with a weed whacker. I have the super duper blade and it it's, uh, takes a lot of work, <laughs> but uh, it, it is effective. Sometimes I don't have the tractor available. Uh, you may be borrowing it from a neighbor. Uh, so I have a backup system. I, I tend to do redundancy is what I'm saying. Okay, how do we calibrate? 
Ah, the fun part. I want you guys to all really focus on that uh, center picture. Note, please, that it has a scale. It says 0, 5, 10, all the way up to 100. That is the approximate rate per acre. Now, you can do a drop uh, spread calculation and, and figure out precisely. Um, your seed is going to be variable, especially in the uh, multiplex. So it might say, okay, 75 pounds. What does that mean? So then you can roll out on a tarp and you can calibrate it as close as possible. Again, seed size is going to make a, a difference in there. So uh, this little green gizmo right in here is actually where the the seed drops in, and you can open and close those. These little gizmos right here, oops, sorry, let me go back, my fault. Uh, these little gizmos regulate the opener. Okay, so when I'm out there doing my first pass, I'm out there, I'm actually digging the seed that I planted to see where the seed is distributed. Because depending upon the size of the seed, if I'm doing fava, I may have this a little bigger opening. If I'm doing vetch, the opening is a little smaller. So, you know, I have to adjust. Um, and this, uh, this little gizmo right in here is the hopper and where the seed goes and drops in. And that paddle um, is right there. Um, I also, over here, uh, this is called the smizer. This is where this gauge is located. That gauge slides. Okay, I always have someone in the back standing there kind of opening the the uh, bin right here to make sure the seed is always constantly going uh, because uh, I'm focused on driving the tractor or whatever. I would also say is a safety issue. When you get to the end of a row, if a person is standing on this, have them get off. One of my core volunteers decided to, at one time, uh, drop the smizer and I was on the back. I almost cut my leg off. So safety first. And so your operator has to recognize when you get to the end of the row and you have to lift it up. Safety first. Okay, so these are these are called roller packers. Uh, this is your openers. This is the tube here that drops the seed in. So to kind of recapture, this is the most critical. Every single system, drill system, has some sort of calibration. Even your hand spreader. You just in a hand spreader, you have to gauge your pace and just play with it until you think you've got the right population of, of seed out. Okay, so here's an example that you may be challenged with. Now, I'm on flat ground. I have a slope, but nothing like this. So depending upon your situation, where do you put your cover crops? What kind of cover crops? Uh, if you have water issues, you can see this. So you kind of got to survey the land and kind of look at it. Okay, this is a contour. Do I put a different type of cover crop? Do I do something different here? Now, down in the rock, you want good drainage, but you can have five different soil types. So you may have to make that management decision. I can't answer that to tell you. So that's where you have to really look at the blends and we're gonna look at some of the, the alternatives. So think about your situation. So these next two slides are just the different species. And look about, look at, uh, now, the classic, I have fava bean, purple vetch. Uh, those are kind of my classics. Um, and, you know, timing of flowering, when it does that, usually when it really starts to flower, the cover crop, I'm chopping it. Sometimes I go a little bit before um, because the nitrogen fixation is done by then. So I'm out there gauging it, looking at it, and then I'll make that uh, management decision. Maybe more difficult for you to do if you're in a vineyard. May, you know, they may, the vines may be pushing out. You got to get a crew in. Hey, you got to make the choice. Um, and you can see all these different types. Uh, I put it as vineyard. Again, all up and down California, there, there's lots of choices. Um, this is for no-till. Again, your own personal experience. Um, uh, my my daughter and son-in-law live down in Escalon, and they have sandy soil that goes 30 feet. I wouldn't be using the same cover crop. I would probably be doing one of these clovers. So depends, again, on your soil condition. I, I step on their soil and my, my shoes uh, get buried at six inches. That's how sandy it is. Whereas in Davis, if I get it wet, 
I've got mud tracking into my house and my wife gets really mad at me. So these are some more examples. Um, and then I found this at uh, one of our local Peaceful Valley Farm Supply. I'm sure in your region, there's some equivalent seed sources, could be Harmony, could be your local supplier. Um, but look at those closely um, and, and look at those significantly and then also talk to people who have done it. So um, again, you know, we talked about drilling and we talked about how to deliver it. So, um, and with that, I think I'm done. Okay, so this last slide is my crew. Those are my two grandkids. So they're gonna be helping me uh, Friday. Those little munchkins, uh, we went out last fall and I'd, spill, I'd left some beans uncovered and they spent 30 minutes covering up the seed for me. So those, my two little grandkids, uh, this is my grandson and my granddaughter, they're fully engaged in, in those kinds of activities. So uh, if you can get your kiddos out there, grandkids, whatever, it's just really fun to have them. So uh, last slide is resources, and uh, that's not an extensive list uh, of things. The one that I really liked is this Cover Crops 101. Very practical. And then some of these, uh, there's, a, there's in one of the ancient publications on cover crops that uh, uh, the ANR put out. It's actually quite good. So it's called Cover Cropping in Vineyards. A little bit older, but it's still very relevant. So with that, I'm done. Is that okay? Where's, where's my host? Hey there, how are you, Gary? Okay, nice job. Thank you ever so much. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay, uh, perfect timing. Um, so we're going to dive into a few of the questions that arose during the course of the presentation, and we don't have a huge number of questions. I actually think we might well be able to uh, yeah. cover all of them. Um, so the first question is, what steps do I need to take to protect seeds from being eaten by birds and to make sure I get a good germination rate of my cover crop seed? Um, well, coverage is really critical. Um, and so that's where that uh, implement of the, the spring tooth harrow um, or something uh, that you can really cover that seed to, to keep the uh, rodents, and it's not just birds, it's also the rodents. Um, we have crows. Uh, here in Davis, and so I have to be out there. I don't go out there and scare all the crows at all times, but uh, the uh, crows here roost all winter. Um, I've seen that um, problem. Mostly what I'm seeing is squirrels uh, in those, but it's coverage and making sure it's, you know, your cover crop has to be down there at least two inches uh, to get good coverage. The birds don't seem to uh, cause that. Um, too much damage for me. Um, but again, it's coverage and, and the implement you use. So uh, just watch that. that. That one slide I showed you with the, uh, the really uh, just scratching it probably won't cover it enough for you. You've got to really get that spring to the harrow or something equivalent, especially in the vineyard, because uh, they do make narrow gauge uh, spring tooth harrows. So, and they also make rotary harrows which is old and ancient, but actually that works pretty well. So just a couple ideas. Um, yeah. Thank you so uh, much, Gary. Yeah, I see a question about uh, how do you keep aphids off the fava beans? Uh, it depends on the species. <laughs> so uh, you never solve the, ultimately all the pests, you live with it. Um, you hope that uh, your uh, native species of, of uh, beneficials, and it's not just, um, uh, oh, what is it, the uh, um, lady beetles. Uh, there, There's a lag between the populations of lady beetles catching up with the aphids. So you kind of got to live with it. What you're looking for uh, was actually what I call the, I call them the dragon stage. Those little guys, the immature stages, are voracious. And when you watch them, they go, they're crazy what they do. And if you've got a really good population of those, that's going to knock it out pretty quickly. Uh, it depends on the species of aphids you have. Where I live and, and do stuff, I have 30 different species of aphids. So mostly what I see in the spring is green peach or, or something similar. 
Um, of course, I don't spray it at all. I don't use any, I don't use any safer soap. I don't use any of that um, at all. I kind of got to live with it. I know my populations are going to be good. Uh, I know I'm going to be fixing nitrogen, so I'm not too worried about it. Um, and hopefully my predator population, and there's more than just ladybugs that are out there. So it just depends a lot on that. Okay, what else? Uh, there's a, it says, I have a large mix of cover crops, et cetera, and seed sizes. Which is the best tool to use when sowing cover crops? Uh, again, if you can do it with the um, no-till drill, the smizer, you can regulate that opener enough to get those, that combination in. Uh, it takes a little practice to do it. So I would recommend, if you're using the no-till drill or equivalent, uh, put a tarp down and roll some out and see how the seed is distributed. You adjust your opener. That takes a little practice. That's in a drill situation. If you're doing a belly broadcaster or simple stuff, um, you adjust. There's an opener generally in the bottom of them, and you just got to crank it and see how it flies, so to speak. And then you may have to walk over it a couple times to, to get it to the coverage and the seed distribution you want, and then immediately cover it. So however you scratch it in, whether you, you could even, remember your seed's not germinated yet. You could lightly run it uh, over with a, a shallow rototiller type system. So don't be afraid. Um, it's not gonna hurt the seed. It hasn't germinated yet. But you know, there's ways you gotta cover it, so. Okay. Uh, how long until I chop fava beans uh, or any? You know, that's, uh, um, the timing is really dependent upon what you're trying to do in the summer. So you have to let time, uh, you, have to, you have to turn it, uh, the cover crop, the fava bean, et cetera. I, I like to say once it starts to hit uh, 18 inches to two feet, I'm out there looking at it. Because, you know, I said four feet. In my situation, because that's how tall it grew, I wasn't out there long enough. But if you can get out there and start chopping it, as soon as you can get on the ground without um, muddying up the field, you don't want to compact the soils. You're in different soil conditions in East Bay. So, uh, you know, you got to walk out there. And you may have to get a walk-behind chopper just to chop it. Um, they do make those. Uh, there's a Blue Max and some other things. And, uh, yeah, you're a small farmer. Hey, I hear you. That's why I put in all the presentations about the different types of drill systems. And be practical. Um, you know, uh, there's a few people that do uh, vineyards that, with the, the Smizer drill and the tie drills, but that's gonna be an additional cost. You'd be better off to get a belly spreader and, and just belly spread it once you get your seed tilt up. Okay. Uh, uh, the question down here from William Hart is compost. Um, do you compost uh, first? That can be tricky. Depends on your soil type. Um, I, I would say yes. In my situation, that's what I've done. And I've used uh, now for the past uh, two years because uh, I've got a really good source of compost. So uh, I would recommend it. It just depends on what it is, and then incorporate it. Get it in the soil mix, because that's going to improve your tilth. And then uh, if you're pre-irrigating, uh, look at your media and see how that's decomposed a bit. Um, sometimes uh, in our, our soils that haven't been fully tilled, and I have that situation too, where I don't get all the stubble turned, it jams my drill. That just means I didn't do my land prep correct. So... Um, but yeah, the compost, I, I would say it depends on the compost a, a bit. Um, I've played with uh, Napa compost uh, and then another one here in Woodland. And uh, it just depends on, on, on when it's made and how hot it is. The compost I have now, I've let sit for a while because uh, they can come in pretty hot. So that's my experience. Anyway, anything else? I think that's all of the questions. Uh, I can actually I have a few questions for Gary. If yeah, unfortunately I couldn't type them into the uh, um, okay. question and answer as a as a host here. But uh, Gary, you 
You mentioned uh, pure pre-irrigation and uh, I'm curious how you gauge how much water you put down and what, what you're aiming for when you're pre-irrigating. <laughs> uh, it's pretty simple. <laughs> I try to get it down at least four inches because that's where my seed bed's going to be. Once I've got it fairly, it's been fairly dry like it's been this fall, like I've got so much dry weather and heat, you know, I don't normally get 95 degrees in September. Um, so I'm, I'm out there, uh, either I'm running a soil probe or I do the old fashioned way, I take a shovel, <laughs> frankly, and I go out and I turn it with a shovel. And if I get moisture, I'm going, okay, we're, we're good. Uh, if I'm not getting it, then I'm coming back and I'm gonna, uh, generally, in my situation, I don't irrigate at all in the day. Everything I do is at night. Um, so that means um, I've got timers and all kinds of things going on. Uh, that's okay, because I, um, you know, but I'm, I'm because I, I'm reducing that water loss as much as possible. So, because uh, water costs money, frankly. Even in Davis, even though Davis doesn't realize how much water costs. <laughs> I farmed a long time. Water costs money. <laughs> yes. No question. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, there's another question there. Can I plant my cash crop right after chopping the cover crop? Depends on what you're trying to do. If, you, if you're doing transplants, um, you know, here's a, here's a practical thing that I've done. I have cut... Uh, uh, cut my uh, cover crop and then I ran my transplanter. I was growing uh, tomatoes or, uh, or some other summer crop. I've gone right back in with my uh, commercial transplanter and actually did a pretty good job. Um, uh, that was with the, the UC system, but that worked pretty well. Depends on what, what it is and, and the root, uh, what you're trying to grow and the follow-up to that, if you're transplanting or directing uh, things, is you have to know the nutrient level um, you're gonna, and how much water is in there. So you have to identify all those parameters that we talked about before. Uh, how did you terminate cover crops in a no-till system? Craft and sword, no herbicide. You tried to mow or crimp. Is that crimp? I don't know what that term is. Yeah. To kill the multiplex. Um, you know, you can adjust uh, your uh, chopper if you have a good chopper or if you have a flail mower. I didn't put a flail mower in there, but if you could flail mow all the way down, you, you go through first and then flail it maybe two to three inches and then come back. First you chop it and then come back and flail mower it. You'll, you'll get it, especially in the no-till. The things with no-till, you got to make sure you get that water penetration. There's winter things. So you've got to be out there looking and with your shovel or your pick or your soil, your soil probe where that moisture is. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I have another question. Other questions? Somebody did. So, um, another quick question, Gary, was uh, you mentioned issues with, uh, you know, weeds and Johnson grass in particular. I'm curious, you know, in some cases, uh, cover crops have been recommended for weed suppression. What has your experience been with? Uh, have you ever tried uh, to use cover crops for weed suppression and have you found that it works in any cases? Um, the overwintering part, yes. But if, if you get into the situation where you've cut it, and, that, you know, my situation is I have such a weed bank that the minute I chop it, till it, I've got such a weed bank because the, his, the cropping history has been there's been no herbicide, selective herbicides used in 30 years. So it's kind of an ideal test <laughs> and what blows in because uh, I get a lot of that cross-contamination um, from the neighbor farm or the neighbor solar panel system. The challenge is, how do I control that no star system? I can't burn it in Davis. And I can't use some other select agents. But it's a problem. Um, so then I end up, I have to go back and chop it. And then I'm spreading more weed seeds. And timing of, say, say it's Johnson grass, or, or say it's uh, star thistle. 
Timing is super critical. Okay, when that star thistle hits that flower stage, stop it. <laughs> You're not going to kill it, but that's as good as you can get. Whereas the Johnson grass, because it's underground, um, you've got to be diligent. And, you know, in my situation, um, once I see it sprouting, or if I've tilled it and I start to see new sprouts, I'm out there with my dang shovel. I'm <laughs> sorry. And now the commercial guys, they're in there with some other uh, things, especially that I have rice uh, growers north of me. So they got Johnson grass out the Johnson grass. Anyway. Good question. It's it's a challenge. I don't have a clear solution. Thanks ever so much, Gary, for your presentation. I want to thank um, also uh, the Cal Department of Food and Ag for funding this effort. Um, also, folks, stay tuned to see down the line videos, hopefully, of Gary's farm site as we do some video uh, demo as well uh, a little bit later in the season hopefully all right and uh, yes. thanks ever so much uh, last call for any other uh, points and with that I think we will close all right thanks everyone take care you guys